Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Glad you could join us tonight for Why the Court of Common Pleas Matter, a joint effort brought to you by MORE, the Mount Lebanon Organization for Racial Equity and Grassroots Justice of the South Hills. First, I'd like to thank MORE's digital team headed by Tessa Watkins for handling all the digital and social media logistics in bringing this event to you. Tessa, we appreciate you every day. So if you're like me, you only really think about judges and courts when it's time to vote or when you have to be before a judge. <laughs> this year, voters have a chance to elect nine judges to the Court of Common Pleas. So there has been a lot of focus on the candidates of this court in particular. Our guest tonight will help us understand how this court works and why it matters. I first uh, want to introduce our guest to you. We have um, the Honorable Kim Berkeley Clark. Judge Clark is President Judge of the 5th Judicial District, which is Allegheny County, the first African American to serve as President Judge in Allegheny County. After serving 16 years as Deputy District Ju Attorney, Judge Clark was elected to the Court of Common Pleas in 1999. She has since been reelected twice. She serves in the family division, primarily hearing cases in the juvenile court. Under George Clark's tenure, the juvenile court has become what administrative judge Kim Eaton calls the gold standard. Judge Eaton went on to state that Judge Clark went above and beyond any administrative judge I've ever known in any division. In conversation with Judge Clark is Ann, Her Ann Herod Stock, the chief deputy court administrator for the fifth judicial district of PA. For 14 years, Ms. Stock worked in the Allegheny County DA's office, helping to prosecute crimes against adults and children. Ms. Stock has, was one of the first attorneys to work in the child abuse unit. Over her career, Ms. Stock has supervised assistant district attorneys, served as the administrator of the Pittsburgh Municipal Court and deputy court administrator, special court to the fifth judicial district. And now in her current position, which she has held since 2020. So welcome to our guests. We are pleased and excited to share your experience and expertise with us tonight. Our moderator is Dr. Elaine France. Dr. France is a member of the Steering Committee and Justice Reform Committee of Moore. Um, <clears throat> and she's also a member of the Grassroots Justice of the South Hills. Her day job is the Professor of History at Kent State University. She is also the author of Ku Klux, the definitive account of the history of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States. Dr. France is currently working on the history of policing in the city of Pittsburgh. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Elaine France. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, I'm so glad and welcome everyone. I'm so glad that everyone is has come out to this really important event. We were thrilled. We looked around, we thought, who could we get to, you know, to speak to us and help us explain the Court of Common Pleas, which is very complicated. And I started calling around and I did not believe um, that I, I somehow made my way to Ann Herod, um, who she said, well, let's let's see, I might, somebody I work with might come out with me. Um, you know, would that be okay? And I was like, oh, sure, you know, and, and then it turned out she was, she was uh, bringing uh, Judge Clark uh, with her to this. And so this is, we're just really, uh, really pleased that both of you are, are gonna uh, take your time to discuss this crucial institution in uh, Allegheny County. And so I'll, I'll let you take it away. So thank you and good evening, everyone. So we just wanna give a couple of disclaimers um, before we begin, or maybe instructions, if you will. Uh, we want you to ask questions and I think questions will come through the chat, but we cannot answer questions about your personal cases. If you have a case pending, uh, we can't talk about your case and we are not permitted to give you legal advice. We can tell you where to go to get legal advice perhaps, but we cannot give it. And we uh, will not answer questions about sort of different judges, but we can talk about what happens in the courts, how cases are processed and all of those things. So that's uh, sort of to put things in the right setting and parameters. And I don't know, Ann Herod, if you wanna add anything to that. All right, so we're gonna start. We have a PowerPoint, which we're gonna run through kind of quickly, just to explain uh, about the um, Fifth Judicial District. And so I'm going to um, 
minimize so I can see it myself, the whole thing. There we go. Um, so we can just go to the next slide. That's just a cover sheet. All right, so just a little bit of background on Allegheny County. So the 5th Judicial District is um, Allegheny County. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have 67 counties, but we have 60 judicial districts. That is because some judicial districts are comprised of more than one county. Um, as probably most of you are aware, um, outside of uh, Allegheny County in the east and sort of Philadelphia in the west rather in Philadelphia in the east there's a lot of rural counties in between and so some judicial districts are made up of more than one county. So our county is pro uh, approximately 1.2 million people 12% uh, black or African American. Um, the population in the city of Pittsburgh is about 300,000, a little more, and about a quarter uh, are African American. So the fifth judicial district is the second largest district, judicial district in Pennsylvania. And in our judicial district, it includes the fifth judicial district includes the Court of Common Pleas, which are the are comprised of 43 judges in the civil, criminal, family, and orphans court divisions. 46 magisterial district judges and the municipal court of the city of Pittsburgh. So next slide. So briefly, we're gonna start and I just have the divisions really here in alphabetical order. So that's why civil division is first. And, and I say that because uh, some people think some divisions are more important than others. Um, and so, uh, a lot of folks think civil division is the most important division, and I would say that um, all of the divisions are equally important, and they're certainly important to the people who have cases before them. So each of our divisions has an administrative judge who was appointed by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. So our administrative judge for the civil division is Judge Christine Ward. And each of the divisions has a deputy court administrator who is Diane Wainwright. And she is the court administrator for the civil division. I am the uh, president judge. And so I oversee all of the divisions and all of the court operations. And I have a district court administrator. Each judicial district has a district court administrator. And that those persons are technically employed by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and work under the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania. Ann Herod, who is presenting with me this evening, is our chief deputy court administrator. And she also works uh, under for the state and under the supervision of the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania courts, as does each of the division administrators. So Diane Wainwright is our deputy court administrator for civil division. Next slide. So civil division, um, these are sort of the cases that they had in uh, 2020. And these are as of, as of December 31st of 2020. So you can see uh, the, the new cases. I'm not gonna go through all the numbers. You can see them for them, themselves, but um, just so you understand, civil cases you largely deal with plaintiff versus defendant action. So those are um, personal injury cases, medical malpractice cases, landlord tenant cases, um, any of the cases where one person is suing another person for money or for damages. Um, and um, they also have a um, commerce court to deal with those complex uh, commercial uh, cases. So as you can see, um, very few jury trials last year uh, because of COVID and jury trials have been suspended. Um, uh, arbitration cases that come through the civil division are cases with damages less than $35,000. And you can see the number of cases that went through arbitration to final award. The appeals from arbitration go to the Court of Common Pleas, to the judges there. So you can see that they did have some appeals from those cases. Um, so the appeal rate from the arbitration board's decision was 32%. So 68% of, of the cases, uh, the parties accepted the decision of the arbitration board. 
And so just to give you a little background, we try, if we can, to do as much of uh, things like arbitration or alternative dispute resolution um, for people to kind of work out and settle cases on their own. It's really sort of the best way to do cases. It's efficient, uh, it's cost effective, and it really keeps um, the, the, the more serious and lengthy cases, uh, it keeps the judges dockets free to do those cases. So it's really a good uh, way to handle cases. Next slide, please. So uh, some pilot programs were launched during COVID um, in all the divisions. These are the ones that they had in uh, civil division. So they did remote hearings conciliations and non-jury trials by judges and the board of viewers. So the board of viewers is the um, panel of um, folks that hear the appeals from uh, property assessments. So if you want to appeal or, or challenge your property assessment, then you would go before the board of viewers. They would have a hearing and make a decision. If you are not satisfied with the de decision, then you would appeal that to a judge in the Court of Common Pleas. So they had remote motions practice for calendar control, general motions, discovery and housing court, um, remote pro bono mediations. Um, uh, they did a collaboration with the Allegheny County Trout Academy and the Allegheny County Bar Association to mediate uh, the September and November trial list. And this was really very beneficial because of the need to socially distance and things like that. We were not doing um, jury trials. And so this was a way to move cases forward without um, having uh, without um, uh, having a trial and therefore keeping people safer. Next slide, please. So the trial list cases, you can see mediated through the pro bono mediation program. They have 427 cases that were mediated by volunteers and 132 of those cases were settled. So that was nice, that was really good. Volunteer lawyers came in to help mediate these cases and it was a wonderful service uh, to the court and to the litigants. Um, remote motions did, uh, during COVID and there's a typo, it says COVID-29, it should be COVID-19 obviously. And that occurred, and then housing court land uh, calendar control motions, housing court landlord tenant motions disposed of, daily calendar motions, and so forth. So you can see all of those things that happened in the civil division uh, during COVID. Next slide, please. So, um, and these are just more. Um, uh, this is more information. Landlord tenant cases. And um, Ann Herod, I don't know if you want to chime any anything in here about sort of landlord tenant cases, because many of those occur before the magisterial district uh, judges. Um, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so the magisterial district courts have jurisdiction over landlord tenant actions for recovery of real property. So um, most landlord tenant actions are initially filed in the magisterial district courts, and then parties can take an appeal to the Court of Common Pleas, um, and it's in a, a trial de novo where they're starting over again with their landlord tenant action um, at the Court of Common Pleas during COVID. Um, we did a lot um, as far as trying to balance the CDC moratorium with evictions and access to courts. So we, um, you know, there were months and periods of time where we didn't have any landlord tenant hearings um, going forward. Um, they're starting to go forward now, but um, Judge Clark's latest court order has a, a nice, we're trying to connect tenants with money um, through the Department of Human Services in the county. So our, our first actions at the magisterial district courts are supposed to be um, status conferences, and we have representatives from DHS there to help um, the landlords and the tenants navigate through the resources available to keep everybody in their housing. And we did start, um, I guess in like 18, a, a housing court help desk that's been very helpful. And, um, you know, the magisterial district courts work in conjunction with the civil division on making sure parties 
know about the help desk and they know what resources are out there um, to help them. So you can see that um, the housing court help desk uh, was very busy, has been very busy. And these are, these are the, uh, this is the, the stats since uh, uh, at, from to the end of uh, 2020. So um, they had a lot of telephone calls, motions where the help desk assisted, uh, an electronic response. Um, uh, and so you can see the number of things that they had. And then the board of viewers, you can see that they've had new tax assessment filings and so forth. And those statistics are there for you. Next slide, please. So then the criminal division, and I think everyone understands um, about the criminal division and uh, what's heard there, obviously cases where um, uh, folks have committed a crime. And so, um, some of the questions that uh, we had that were um, sort of given to us um, ahead of time involve um, the criminal division. So I'm gonna ask maybe Ann Herod to kind of, before we go on to the next slide to sort of walk um, you through what happened. So there was a question that we had, if you were a person with a felony criminal charge coming before the court, what steps do you go through? So Ann Herod, can you kind of walk us through sure. what that process would be. Sort of like how to become a bill from that old TV yeah. show. <laughs> we should write a song about that. Yeah. That would be nice. So generally, um, cases are filed by police agencies. So um, they're initially filed by a criminal complaint. Um, if it's a felony case, some felony charges have to get prior approval from the district attorney's office before the police are permitted to file those charges. Um, felony charges. And a lot of the criminal division and the procedures are mandated by our rules of criminal procedure. So there's not always options to um, change things and how it happens. But if you're charged specifically with a felony offense, um, an arrest warrant would be issued. Um, the person would be arrested and then they're taken to um, either their local magisterial district judge or our Pittsburgh Municipal Court to be arraigned. Um, our Pittsburgh Municipal Court is a 24 hour operation, um, 365 days a year, it never closes. So we're doing um, arraignments 24 hours um, down there. So generally if it's a, a felony or, or a dangerous offense, a lot of the police agencies will bring the defendant straight to the um, jail and then they'll be arraigned through there. At the preliminary arraignment, the person that's been arrested is given a copy of their criminal complaint or an arrest warrant. They're notified of their preliminary hearing date, um, which is 14 days if they're not gonna be incarcerated or 21 days if, I mean, 14 days if they are incarcerated and 21 if they're not. And then um, their right to counsel. It's not really an interactive process where um, the people that are arrested participate. I mean, they can participate when asked questions, but we really try to make sure their rights are protected and they don't start talking about the crime that they allegedly, um, have committed and are charged with. So once, and so misdemeanor charges, um, same thing, misdemeanor ones, unless it's a driving under the influence are issued by arrest warrant. Um, lower misdemeanors can be sent what we call a summons in the mail to the person. The misdemeanor cases, um, when they're arrested, same arraignment process they go through as well. Um, and then their next court hearing would be the preliminary hearing um, which again is where the Commonwealth presents their case before a magisterial district judge. And the threshold is a prima facie case, which is a pretty low threshold in the um, criminal justice system. It's basically was a crime committed and did this person probably commit that crime? Um, and then the magisterial district judge has a couple of different options at the preliminary hearing. They can dismiss the case. The district attorney may withdraw the case. Um, the district attorney may work out an agreement with the defense attorney and the defendant um, for like a diversionary program. We have a, a robust batters in, intervention program for domestic violence cases. Um, if people are in need of mental health treatment, um, that can be handled at that level. And then the case can stay at the magisterial district court if everybody agrees being the, the parties on the case. Um, and their third option would be to hold the case and send it to the court of common pleas. Um, once it gets to the Court of Common Pleas, there's a, a formal arraignment, which is an official notification of 
what's a document called the criminal information where the district attorney's office files their um, official paperwork. Um, some states call it indictment, but we in Pennsylvania have criminal informations. Um, and then um, there's a, a pretrial conference and then they, they go to trial. So that's basically um, the life of a case in the criminal justice system. You know, there are a lot of plea agreements. Um, those agreements are between the parties in the case. I'm trying to resolve the case. Um, and then I don't know, Judge, if you want to get into our diversion treatment courts now or wait till we get to that slide. Yeah, we'll wait till the slide. Thank you, Ann Harris. So let's, so as you can see, Jill Rankus is our administrative judge of the fam of the criminal division and Tom McCaffrey is the deputy court administrator for criminal division. Next slide. So here you can kind of see the 2020 um, criminal court caseload. Uh, and these numbers actually go through um, the end of September of 2020. Um, so you can see um, what uh, the sort of difference maybe in the cases that were disposed of in 2019, though that's all of 2019 and the cases that were disposed of through September of 2020. Um, and how these cases were um, disposed of either expedited court dockets, ARD, um, which is the Accelerated Rehabilitative Disposition Program for First Offenders, where they will have some conditions of supervision. And if they complete those, then uh, the charge is dismissed and they, their record can be expunged. They will not be uh, found guilty. And then, um, 45% of the less complex cases being disposed of more faster and more efficiently, leaving 55% of the more complex cases having greater time and attention by the judicial staff at trial. And I will say though, that we are working on some things um, in criminal division um, and uh, looking at different ways to um, sort of divert cases. There are many of the sort of low grade misdemeanor cases that many people feel uh, the community would be better served, the courts would be less clogged if we could divert those and hold people accountable for those offenses in a different way. So it's uh, there's a lot of diversion going on in the juvenile court um, and we're trying to divert more from there as well. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a graphic of the criminal court caseload. I don't know how well you can really see it here. I think you all, uh, I don't know whether they were given the PowerPoint or not, or have access to the PowerPoint, but it's just sort of the active cases by month from September 30th um, of 2009 to September 30th of, of 2020. And I think what's important, which you can see is how the caseload has definitely dropped. So uh, we are keeping more cases out of the criminal justice system uh, and really trying to focus on those more serious cases that should be in the court system. And uh, I think that's a good thing. So I think that is really easy to see because you can see how they start way at the top and how it dropped. There's some, you know, real low points and uh, a little peak, um, I think it looks like in uh, 2018, and then a little drop again. So uh, we're kind of happy looking at this when we look at this particular uh, graphic. Next slide, please. And then the time to disposition, trying to reduce the number of days it takes to really resolve a criminal case. So um, when you look at the uh, the 2010 where it starts, I guess the average time to disposition was about 206 days. And then we had a drop, the steady drop, and then sort of it flattened out in around 2014 and 2015, 115 days. And then it's crept up again. And so there's a little, it's interesting because um, despite uh, COVID, there was not a serious sort of uh, uptick in the time to disposition in 2020. Next slide. 
So criminal division has an adult probation and pretrial services. And so within the fifth judicial district and part of uh, the fifth judicial district is both adult and juvenile probation It's part of the courts. So adult probation, um, were, they were supervising 18,075 people. Pre-trial services, which is the bail supervision, um, they were supervising uh, 2,581 people. Um, we have uh, 140 adult probation officers. Um, um, average um, caseload is uh, 75 medium to high risk people per officer and average 444 low risk people per officer, um, which is really way too many. And so we are really looking at ways to kind of get uh, supervision to close earlier um, so that the, again, the adult probation officers are really spending time and paying attention to those people who really need a lot of supervision in the community. Next slide, please. So we have a number of problem solving courts in the uh, criminal division. Um, and so we have uh, the active cases uh, on supervision in each of those courts. Uh, you can see there as of September 30th of 2020. So we have a drug court, a DUI court, a sex offender court, mental health court, veterans court, domestic violence court, and pride court, uh, which deals with largely prostitution uh, cases, um, which many would include victims of human trafficking in those cases. So um, total 1140 cases uh, in the problem solving courts in criminal division as of September 30th, 2020. So criminal division has the largest number of problem solving courts, though, as you heard, civil division has one too, which is its housing court. Um, and problem solving courts are a different way of handling cases instead of in the traditional way, for example, uh, someone who is charged with drug possession um, and just to impose probation and punishment, subject the person to technical violations and incarceration does not work for people that are suffering from uh, a substance use disorder. Um, so we want a better way of holding people accountable, keeping communities safe, but really helping uh, persons address their issues um, that led to their offenses and thus reduce recidivism. They are known to be very effective, um, very trauma informed. Uh, they require a high level of oversight by the court. Um, there is more frequent review. In an ordinary criminal case, a person is, if they're placed on probation, uh, they may never see their judge again if they're just doing what they need to do, complying with the conditions and just waiting to complete those so their case can be closed. But in the problem solving courts, there's the, this frequent review, there's a system of what in the juvenile court system we would call graduated responses. So there are rewards for when they hit certain milestones and goals, because we know that ordinary human beings, both adults and children, respond better to rewards rather than sanctions. And there's a theory that you should have for every sort of sanction or punishment, you should have four rewards. So there should be this four to one ratio of rewards and, and sanctions. And it's a very effective way. So there's ceremonies when uh, people complete things and graduations when they have completed all of their goals and the cases are closed. And so it works really well for all of these types of, of offenses. Sex offender court is a little bit different because of the nature of the offenses, but drug court, DUI court, mental health court, and veterans court all pretty much work under the same uh, way. These are folks that have some substance abuse issues or mental health abuse issues that really lead to their offending. It's clear that their offending behavior is as a direct result or indirect result of um, substance abuse or mental health disorders. Next slide, please. So pretrial services. Um, so this is, uh, you know, what happens. Um, these are folks that have not yet uh, had their trial. Um, that's the term pretrial services. And so 
Uh, there are a number of types of hearings that may happen uh, before a person gets to the trial stage. So people, uh, I think Ann Harrod told you when uh, somebody is charged with a crime, if they're arrested, they will have a bail hearing, they'll, be, they'll have an arraignment, bail will be set. Um, and so if the person is out on the community in the community and they violate a condition of bail, that means bail can be forfeited. Um, and they can, uh, they would have a hearing to determine whether there should be bail should be revoked or whether there should be any changes. Uh, anyone, a defendant can petition for, or the district attorney for a bail modification to change conditions of bail, to reduce bail, and then walk-in reinstatements. There's a process for people who have bail was forfeited, but they can, they want to turn themselves in. They can walk into the courthouse and say, I didn't show up for my hearing. Um, I want to get, you know, have a bail hearing. I want to fix that. And many of those folks, the, the, the situation is corrected when they walk in, they're given their new date and so forth. And then new pretrial investigations. This would happen when a new case comes in, the pretrial services department begins an investigation to make recommendations about the bail and so forth. And then, um, we just want to put in there the jail population as of September 30th, uh, 2020 was 1,848. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, the jail population and what has been done, particularly during the pandemic, to reduce the population in the jail. And I should have looked at that number today so I could have had that for you, and I did not think to do that. So I would apologize um, because I do believe it is actually significantly lower than the 1848 that it was on September 30th. Um, so um, you can see that um, the uh, walk-in reinstatement number of 609 or individuals that had active warrants and then turned themselves into pretrial services. Uh, these individuals would have been lodged in the jail for a minimum of 72 hours awaiting a hearing if this procedure had not been established. So this procedure was established to allow people to turn themselves in so we would not have to have them lodged in the jail for those three days or so waiting to have their uh, bail reinstated. Um, next slide. So uh, we also have community resource centers. Uh, we have them in the North, East, South and Mon Valley. And you can see there were 815 referrals as of March 16, 2020. And you can uh, look at that, the numbers for yourself. Um, uh, 384 people were transferred for job search, drug ass assessments and life skills training uh, as of January 1st through March 16th, 2020. And, but due to the pandemic in-person services have been suspended since March 16th, 2020. Next slide. And then electronic monitoring, monitoring. So we have the ability for people that might uh, impose some risk to not show up at their hearing or a risk to maybe reoffend before uh, they have their court hearing. They can be released on electronic monitoring. And so um, you can see the numbers there of um, the, the average of folks that were under supervision from January 1st through September 20th, 2020, the recidivism percentage of those in EHM 4.7%, uh, and uh, the EHM fees in the adult system, the criminal system, um, there are fees that are assessed to pay for EHM, um, though there is a sliding scale uh, based on income, so not everybody has to pay the same fee. And then the beauty of EHM is jail days that are saved. So we have, we estimated that 263,900 or almost 264,000 jail days were saved through the by the EM program in September in, in 2020. And that's just through September 30th of 2020. Next slide. So um, there's a DUI alternative to jail program. And I'm not gonna go through all of that because I wanna get to some of the other things. And then next slide, I think this is a, an important slide. So this is uh, the COVID-19 response in uh, reducing the jail population. 
So the maximum inmate capacity at the county jail is 2,880 beds. Um, the inmate population at the jail and alternative housing as of March 16th, 2020. So that was sort of the beginning of our judicial emergency, the beginning of the pandemic. There were 2,391 inmates in the county jail on March 16, 2020. And as of September 30th, 2020, um, we reduced that population to 1,848 uh, inmates. And um, so that was a 23% decrease due to coordinated efforts. And I do wanna give a shout out to our pretrial services uh, unit, uh, the P Office of the Public Defender, the District Attorney's Office, jail staff um, who did an outstanding job in trying to identify uh, folks that could be released from the jail um, without um, um, putting rest to the community. And Ann Harris just told me that there's, uh, today's population is 1,666. So we are continuing to work on this reduction of the population in the jail. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we know about the population disproportionately uh, persons of color are incarcerated in the jail. It kind of smacks you in the face if you go into the jail and you see who's there and you see the, the, the jail full of black and brown faces. It really is startling. And so um, we're looking at that. But I will uh, tell you that when we reduce the numbers of inmates in the jail significantly, um, it did not decrease the disproportionality that actually rose. So we're still working not only to reduce the physical numbers of persons in the, in the Allegheny County Jail, the number of residents in the jail, but we also want to uh, uh, decrease the disproportionality. That's for a whole nother discussion. <laughs> so that can take up a whole presentation in and of itself. Next slide, please. And so um, the court response to COVID-19, I would just say, you know, I'm not gonna go um, through all of these because we really had a kind of standard court wide response in all of the divisions during doing as many things as we could remotely or handling as many things administratively as we could, obviously uh, releasing folks from the jail. Um, so the response uh, was, these are some of the responses in criminal division to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk about the family division. Kim Eaton is the administrative judge of the family division. Family division actually has three deputy court administrators um, because that's the one division that has many different things that happen in it. So family division includes the, the traditional family division things, domestic relations. So custody, uh, child support, divorce, equitable distribution of property. Um, and it also includes protection from abuse, but it also includes the juvenile uh, cases, which are juvenile delinquency, juveniles who have been charged with crimes and what we call dependency. Those are the cases uh, that involve children, youth and families where there are allegations usually of abuse and neglect of children. And we're looking at uh, trying to, uh, keep kids in their home or placing kids in foster care um, because of the situations in the home. So they have three uh, administrators, uh, Rus deputy court administrators, Russell Carlino, who is the administrator for juvenile probation, or as we call him, the chief juvenile probation officer. Patrick Quinn is our child support, or we call him the 4D administrator because 4D is the, um, the funding, the social security funding that is associated with child support enforcement and collection. And Cynthia Stoltz, who is the administrator for what we call the children's court, which is the dependency cases. And uh, she also uh, supervises or is the administrator for our domestic violence unit, which handles the protection from abuse cases. Next slide. So uh, the adult section, um, it includes the child support. And I will say we're very proud that Allegheny is considered the number one urban jurisdiction 
in America based on federal um, performance criteria. We receive the maximum amount of federal in incentive money available based upon this performance. So there's an incentive to courts to collect and, and enforce child support orders. So we get approximately $4 million from the federal government uh, um, based upon our performance. And so you can see there on the, the, uh, the slide, the um, number of cases with orders, the paternity establishment, the current support collections, arrears, uh, and the, in the 2019 collections, we collected um, $17,879,382 in child support. So that was really good. Next slide. And then divorce, I think everybody understands what that is child support, these are just the filings, and then custody complaints filed. So I think those are all pretty self-explanatory. Next slide. So um, the next one is the children's court. So dependency, um, so this, these are, this is the data on the cases that we have. So just to tell you, um, emergency custody authorization requests. So by law, if children, youth, and families wants to take emergency custody of a child, they have to do it by court order. They can't just go in and take a child. Police officers are permitted to take protective custody of children, but they can't, CYF can't take the assumed custody of the child without a court order. It can be verbal um, because uh, it might happen in the middle of the night, which it often does. And by statute, there always has to be a judge on call to answer those requests. So in the family division, there's a judge always on call 24 seven to uh, issue those verbal orders if, if CYF is asking during the regular, the non-court hours. So weekends, holidays, and after court is closed. And then if the child, uh, the, if a child is taken into custody, they have to, um, there has to be a hearing in court within 72 hours. That's called the shelter care hearing and those orders are issued. And if the child is not returned to the care of the parents or guardians at the shelter care hearing, then CYF has to file a petition for dependency within 24 hours. And there, uh, the hearing is to be scheduled within 10 days, the adjudicatory hearing. Um, protection from abuse, you can see the uh, temporary PFAs petitions that were granted the indirect criminal contempt uh, hearing schedule for violating a condition of the PFA order. Um, we also do in the family division, some adoption cases. Technically adoptions go under the orphans court. And when we do them in the family division, we sit as orphans court judges, but all of the adoption cases, including the petitions to terminate parental rights and then the adoption hearings that come stem from the dependency cases are handled by the judges in the family division who hear the dependency cases. Next slide. We have National Adoption Day every year. Last year, um, it was virtual because um, of the pandemic. And so each year uh, we do participate in National Adoption Day. It's always the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And this year or last year in 2020, uh, 76 children were adopted into permanent and loving homes and 10 judges participated. Um, we do adoptions other times. So those were not the adoptions, only adoptions that occurred in 2020. Those were the ones that occurred on National Adoption Day. Next slide. Um, juvenile delinquency. So you can see the cases that were handled uh, in uh, 2020. Um, I will say that the processing for delinquency cases occurs much like those for uh, dependency cases. So if a juvenile was arrested by the police and detained at the detention center, um, then they have to have a detention hearing before a hearing officer or judge within 72 hours. If the juvenile was not released, the probation department must file the petition for delinquency within 24 hours and a, the adjudicatory hearing is set uh, has to be scheduled in 10 days. And then you can see um, the case statistics on juveniles with active, that are active with juvenile probation, how many have been adjudicated delinquent, who are on probation and day treatment program, et cetera, et cetera. 
Next slide. Um, so um, we can do under the Juvenile Act, um, the probation department can adjust a case. Uh, it's a form of diversion. Um, so anytime before the petition is filed. So if the police make a referral to juvenile court, the probation department, um, obviously in cons consultation with the district attorney can adjust the case and uh, do an informal adjustment without filing a petition and without adjudicating uh, the juvenile delinquent, the juvenile would not come before a judge. And so there will be some conditions imposed that they must complete within six months. And if they are, then um, the case is over and the records are expunged. Then we have the consent decree, which is similar to ARD in criminal cases, which would occur after a, con uh, after a petition has been filed. Um, and so those are some types of diversion we have. We also are now working with a pre-referral uh, uh, diversion uh, where the police can make the referral for diversion and it never even comes before a probation officer. So we really are, I think, doing a good job at trying to increase the number of cases that are diverted. And then you can see uh, the cases that were closed in 2020 um, 98% of juveniles completed their, um, their community service, 89% paid restitution in full, and the average length of supervision was 17 months, which we are really looking at trying to reduce that. There is data that says that that really is too long and juveniles do better with shorter periods of supervision. Next slide. This just gives you an idea of our juvenile probation staff. Um, so we have 255 juvenile probation staff and you can see there's different levels, um, you know, probation officers, assistant chief probation officers and supervisors and so forth. And we have 111 uh, probation officers in, in the juvenile court and you can see what they do. Next slide. And then these are our delinquency diversion programs. If you have the slides, uh, I would encourage you to look at it. So we have system diversion, pre-allegation diversion, alternatives to diversion, and pre-petition diversion. So these are all before the case would ever come to court. These are keeping cases away from court. Um, so the, this does not include the consent decree type cases. Next um, slide. And so these are the alternatives, again, to detention. We want to keep as many folks, as many young people out of the detention home. And so um, we really have done a good job at keeping those numbers low. Um, so and next, um, so we use electronic monitoring heavily and home detention. Unlike criminal court, we juveniles are not assessed any fees for anything. So they're not, they don't have to pay any fees for electronic monitoring or anything. So that is all borne by the, the court um, or the county for them. Next slide. Um, this just shows you the juvenile detention status, um, the average daily census at Schumann Center. Um, you can see in 2019, the average daily census was 36 and in 2020, it was 23. And then we have a a secure shelter at, at Auberly Hartman Shelter. And so you can see the average daily cent census in 2019 was nine and in 2020, or uh, it was um, six. Next slide. And so we have uh, family division, we have uh, um, community intensive supervision programs, which we call SIS. So it's a court operated community based alternative to residential placement for male youth. So we want to keep as many kids out of placement in the community. So some of our actually pretty high level offenders um, would be participating in SIS, which outside of COVID, they would be physically participating in that in those centers that, that are in the communities, Garfield, Hill District, Monioc, Northside, Penn Hills, and Wilkinsburg, seven days a week. So they're in those six neighborhoods. So they move about a bit 
in different centers due to COVID. So um, at the end of 2020, we had 103 youth engaged in CIS. Next slide. Orphans Court Division, uh, Judge Lawrence O'Toole is the administrative judge and Paul Stefano is the deputy court administrator. Next slide. So Orphans Court deals with guardianships, estates, civil commitment hearings, and adoptions. And so um, these are the statistics of new petitions filed. Um, uh, and you can see they also do adoptions there and they did 46 adoptions last year and the family division did 76 just on National Adoption Day in November. So um, the majority of the adoptions actually take place now in the family division. Next slide. And so um, we have the magisterial district courts. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna turn this one over to Ann Harrod. We can go to the next slide, I think. Thank you, Judge Clark. Um, the magisterial district courts, I know you had an event on it um, a few weeks ago, but there are 46 in Allegheny County. Um, it's really, they're the courts where probably the most people interact with the court system because they handle, their jurisdiction handles so many um, smaller cases. So they'll handle civil cases where the amount sought is less than $12,000 on the criminal preliminary arraignment, preliminary hearings that we discussed, um, landlord tenant cases, miscellaneous docket case filings or things like search warrants um, will be in that, emergency protection from abuse orders, ICCs will fall under that category. Non-traffic cases, those are your citations. So that's you know the disorderly conduct. And if you have teenagers, hopefully not an underage drinking citation, you know, things like that end up as a non-traffic case filing. Your um, borough ordinance violations would end up as a non-traffic um, case filing. And then your traffic case filings are your parking tickets, your moving violations, um, whatnot. So in, um, that gives you just the number we had in um, 2020, which is you know 1,469.62. Um, it's really gone down, I would say, from 2019. I think it's, it's gone by, down by about 100,000 cases, I would say, um, probably due to, to COVID-19 and due to the court closures and reopening. Um, but they, they're doing a lot of work in those 46 courts, and they have you know, limited staff members. Yeah, every court has their different jurisdictions. Your one in Mount Lebanon is Mount Lebanon and Dormont. You know, one... Um, I live in Oakmont. Oakmont's MDJ is in Plum, so we go to Plum for that. So they, you know, it's done regionally, um, and it's gone down. There, there. Initially, there were over sixty magistrate district courts, and over time, it's it's gone down to where we are, um, probably at the right size of forty six at this point in time. And as Judge Clark mentioned, we also have Pittsburgh Municipal Court, which is where all criminal and summary cases that take place in the corporate limits of the city of Pittsburgh are filed. And so judges um, go through there on a rotating basis. So um, mostly the city elected judges within the city of Pittsburgh offices, there are 13, 12 or 13 of those, they'll handle most of the day-to-day -day operations. And then your magisterial district judge will come at night and do arraignments throughout the night, weekends and holidays. So the 46 rotate um, there as well. I know Elaine had asked me about homicide cases by local rule, all homicide filings are filed at Pittsburgh Municipal Court and all Act 33 cases are filed at Pittsburgh Municipal Court where the um, juvenile is charged with an adult crime. That's filed at, at that court as well. So until 2005, Pittsburgh Municipal Court was handled by the city of Pittsburgh. They had appointed magistrates um, and they were called magistrates as opposed to magistrate district judges. And then in 2005, um, the Supreme Court decided that the um, Pittsburgh Municipal Court would become part of the unified judicial system. And so it was created um, and those city magistrates no longer sit. We have elected magisterial district judges who handle the cases in that court. So it's a quick one on magisterial district courts. Right, so, so that's a quick run through sort of through the fifth judicial district. 
So I guess, you know, we can answer some questions at this time, but before we do that, I would just like to say one thing. So the sort of top, the title of our presentation was why the Court of Common Pleas, or why the Court of Common Pleas matters. So I just want to say a couple of things about that, because the judiciary is a separate and co-equal branch of government. And most people really don't think about judges who they're, uh, who they're electing or who is sitting as a judge until they have a case in court, and usually when they don't like the result of the case. Um, so I'm going to tell you why judges matter. Um, Judges have a lot of power and authority. Um, a judge of the court of common pleas can put you in jail. They can, I can take someone's children. I can terminate someone's parental rights. I can incarcerate a child. I can impose the death penalty. I can deny bond. There's all kinds of things that a judge can do um, that are really serious and important and affect the lives of the citizens in the districts in which we serve. And for judges of the Court of Common Pleas, our jurisdiction is, extends over the entire county. The magisterial district judges likewise are important too, even though their jurisdiction is only in their district, um, they make very important decisions in terms of landlord and tenant issues, um, you know, whether or not to uh, find someone guilty of, of, of a summary offense. They set bond in criminal cases, uh, which can be a life-changing event. Um, so there's a lot of authority uh, by the court that the court has. And I think that people should be very concerned and about who is making these decisions in their lives and that they should um, find out as much as they can about the candidates that are running so that they can make good choices um, about their judges. So it's extremely important. And so I think the Court of Common Pleas matters a lot. I mean, we have appellate courts, they're extremely important, but the day-to-day -day things that happen, a small percentage of the cases get appealed. Um, very few cases get appealed. So people accept the decision of the magisterial district judge or the judge in the court of common pleas, um, even if they don't like it. And there are reasons for that. Some people are self-represented. It's very hard to perfect and file and navigate the appellate system if you are representing yourself. There's a cost to it. If you have a lawyer, you have to pay somebody to do it. There are things like filing fees and you have to order transcripts. So there's a lot of, there's appellate rules which are different from the rules uh, for the, the trial court. So there's a lot of reasons that people might not take an appeal. Even when I have to concede, if they did, they might very well prevail in the appellate court or get some different relief or some change in the order that the lower court gave. But um, the bottom line is most people don't. And so the judges who are making these decisions are really making sort of final decisions that affect the lives of the citizens in Allegheny County. So it's really important. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And um, so I know Elaine, you had a number of questions for us. I think some of them were answered in the uh, presentation, but I don't know whether you want to ask any of the questions that you have. And I do believe that there are some things in the chat and we could probably go through some of those as well. Well, I'll take, I'll have one question that's just, I just can't not ask, um, which is a slightly, it's a slightly different version of what I had written down in, um, you know, initially, but it's because you've been talking about these COVID, you know, the, these these remarkable responses to COVID um, and the numbers are, you know, are really, they're striking. And I guess everybody now is saying, oh, well, COVID is going to change things in some ways permanently. You know, we all, you know, that there's some of the things we've learned from COVID and ironically, or, or you know, you know, are gonna, we're going to carry forward. And I'm just wondering, is that, do you think that any of these changes that you're talking about that, that have been made have sort of been a way to sort of maybe, maybe start a per, more permanent transformation or, or how much of these are, are planning to reset? Yes. Yeah, so I will say this. So one of the things that I think 
is sort of a change is the way we are really diligently reviewing people that are incarcerated in the jail and trying to release as many people safely into the community. Um, and so we had a goal prior to this, you know, we, we, we have a grant with MacArthur and we have a safety and justice challenge. And one of the goals was to reduce the jail population. Well, we did meet our goal in COVID. And so now we have another goal. So we just want to keep that number low. Um, and so we're working hard to try to do that. And we've discovered that when we released so many people from the jail, um, the community wasn't really any less safe than it was with those people in jail. Um, and there's what I call this sort of trickle down effect that nobody thinks about when somebody goes to jail. I see it a lot in the family division because I provide preside over dependency cases. So frequently I'll get a case that comes in and uh, a parent has is in jail. And so poor people, everything is harder when you're poor. Um, uh, Judge Eaton in the family division brought a presenter to Allegheny County. I guess it was at the end of 2019, I, I think. Uh, on we had a summit on poverty and what the presenter Jody Farr made people understand that trying to navigate anything is when you're poor is just difficult so when people don't show up for court it's really not that they're trying to miss their court hearing and be disrespectful they're they just might not have bus fare that morning or the resources to get there. And while I would think my court hearing is the most important thing, they're making a choice that money, uh, whatever it costs is might be breakfast or a meal for their family. And they're making a choice to do something else. Um, it's just complicated when you don't have resources. So when you have a parent that's poor um, and is arrested, a number of things can happen. So maybe that, that mom, maybe it's a single mom with children and she was struggling sort of to pay her rent and has paid some rent, but is just kind of not doing it real well. And, but the landlord is, she hasn't evicted her, but believe you me, he's going to hear when mom gets arrested and he may then go in and change the locks and take the stuff. And so housing is gone. CYF is going to come and take her children her children are gone. Um, she may have a job that she's working under the table or, you know, working for, you know, a small, you know, community store or something, and they can't afford to keep that job open, even for three or four days. She might be released from jail in three or four days, but in those three or four days, she's lost her home, her children, her possessions, and her job, and has nothing. And so prior to jail, she was caring for her kids. And so now the taxpayers are paying someone to care for her kids. Prior to jail, she was not homeless and on the street. Prior to going to jail, she had some income and was paying some taxes and being able to spend money in the community and that's all gone. So we don't think about the trickle down effect that incarceration has particularly on the poor. Um, and so when we talk about racial and ethnic disparities, I always say that you can't leave, we, we can't have that conversation without talking about poverty. Um, you know, I'm old enough to, you know, think about, you know, to remember Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society where poverty was at the forefront of sort of all the conversations and discussions and somehow we kind of put that on the back burner. But when we think about racial and ethnic disparities, poverty is one of them. People of color are more likely to be living in poverty. So when you have the poverty and that also contributes to the racial and ethnic disparities. So um, that's one thing, how we, when we look at who's in the jail, I think those are permanent changes. The other thing that we've discovered is, is particularly in cases like I hear, dependency cases, doing hearings virtually has increased court participation by parents because it's easier for them to attend court. They don't need bus fare to come to court. They don't need to find someone to care for their kids to come to court. 
they can just at the appointed time turn on their device and connect to the hearing. And I think personally, I have more information and I make better decisions when I hear from everyone and I have the most information. And I've realized that it's not that these parents don't want to come to court. It's just that it's difficult for them to come to court. We don't understand that. And then part of it is even for people that come, it's the way we do hearings. I, it's been, I have, I no longer personally hear my my cases um, in sort of the cattle call fashion. In other words, every hearing that I have gets a time specific slot so that people aren't sitting there coming in. If I have five cases scheduled at nine o'clock, I can only hear one case at nine o'clock. So one person's case will be heard at nine o'clock and the others will be heard whenever I get to them after that first nine o'clock case. And so what I'm saying is that you may not be able to have a whole day to spend in court or that's not your expectation. You know, if your hearing is scheduled at nine o'clock, you know kind of what the hearing is about. You might think, well, I'll be good by noon so I can go to work or I'm, I, there's enough time to go home and get my, meet my kids who are getting off the school bus. It's enough time to pick up my kids from daycare and I won't have to pay a penalty because they've been there too long. So I think, you know, we're looking at trying to continue virtual participation post um, the pandemic. And everyone all over Pennsylvania is going to be looking at all of these issues. There may be things like rules changes that may have to happen to permit it. But I think everybody is now thinking, wow, this has been a benefit to many, many people to have virtual court. Um, I, and it's worked really well. And in some cases, I think it has actually worked better. I, I, it, uh, early on in the pandemic, I had a case where I had to have an interpreter. And when I was informed, well, you're going to have an interpreter, Judge Clark, and because there was somebody that spoke Arabic and we needed interpreter. And I was really worried. I'm like, oh, my good Lord, how are we going to have this interpreter work? But, you know, it actually worked really well. I think it actually worked better than having the person physically there. The interpreter could see everyone. He, he could see the person for whom he was interpreting. He could see the lawyers. Everybody seemed to know because they could see each other in a different way when to pause to let the interpreter interpret and and it just worked beautifully. I was shocked. So I think, yeah, I think life as we knew it has changed forever. Um, and I think some things will remain in place. Thank you. Now we have three questions uh, that I can see here. Uh, oh, maybe four. Um, but uh, the, the all look really, really uh worth asking. Um, and, and the first is uh, a question that asks, um, can a judge, it kind of like what the judge's, the scope of the judge's authority is uh, largely like related to criminal justice things, um, I, I think in this question, but, you know, can a judge in fact make an impact that, that kind of the, the, the particular judge uh, make an impact on how much cash bail is used on whether there's cattle call trials um, you know, on whether, uh, you know, single judges follow one case all the way through, uh, whether, uh, you know, whether, whether um, tenants are better represented, housing tenants are better represented in courts, you know, some judges, uh, some people who are making the case for being a judge saying, oh, I can do this or I can do that. Um, and what we don't know, just because of our sort of ignorance of the system, is we don't know, are these the kind of discretions that judges have? So... Some of the questions deal with sort of procedural things. Um, some of them um, are, so there are rules of court that we have to follow. Um, rules of court um, are developed by rules committees um, and that are overseen by the Supreme Court. So they make recommendations for the creation of new rules or modifications of rules, which must be approved by the Supreme Court. So rules have to be followed. So rules change because of different responses. So I'll give you an example. Everyone I think is familiar with the Kids for Cash scandal in Luzerne County. And so after that, there was an interbranch commission who made recommendations and there were sweeping rules changes that happened um, as a result of the kids for cash scandal. Right now, Governor Wolf has convened a juvenile, a statewide juvenile justice task force um, based in 
I think largely in response to some things that happened in terms of some of the juvenile residential facilities in Pennsylvania where juveniles were mistreated. Um, and I think there, I am privileged to serve on that task force. Um, we've had a series of meetings which were public and now we're, our report recommendations and report will be due at the end of this month to the governor. So we may recommend additional changes to rules um, or statute. Um, and so um, that may happen. So rules, those kind of statewide rules have to be, um, the rules of court have to be actually made by the Supreme Court going through the rules committees. Some are statutory, which has to go through the General Assembly. So the House and the Senate have to make changes to the existing statutes. Judges are obligated to follow the law, but there are policies and procedures that each court can make. Um, you know, we have local rules. Some of the changes don't even require rules. So one of the questions was about one judge following a case through. So in our family division, we have a one family, one judge policy because there's a lot of overlap between the domestic relations side and the juvenile side. And when I first came on the bench, we weren't even in the same building. Juvenile court was in Oakland in the old health department building and the family division was on the sixth floor of the city county building. So we weren't even in the same place to coordinate or talk to each other. And so it was really decided that it was really best for one judge to handle all of those matters. It's more efficient, um, you know, and it's really more trauma informed. A lot of what happens in the family division involves traumatic incidents. And, you know, every time you go into in front of a new judge, that person has to share their trauma again and again. In other words, we're re-traumatizing a person because they're coming in front of me and I don't know them and I haven't heard their story and I need to hear the story in order to understand what the case is about to make a decision. But if it had gone before the judge that knew the story who had already heard that, they don't have to start from square one and we're not re-traumatizing people. Things like not having cattle call schedules, that's really up to, it can be something that a division decides, but an individual judge can really decide how they want to handle their docket. So for example, I have decided that I want to give all my cases a time specific, uh, a time specific slot. So people have a reasonable expectation about when their case is going to go. It's not perfect because sometimes the case I scheduled at nine o'clock that I thought was only going to take 30 minutes there might be more complex issues and we might an hour later still be in that hearing, but at least everybody's not showing up at nine o'clock and then waiting until three, some people waiting until three o'clock to be heard. So some are things that individual judges can do. Some things are that we can change by local rule or policy. And then some changes have to be made by statewide rules. And, and some have to be made through the legislature to change the actual statutes. And Herod, I don't know whether you wanna add anything to that. No, I think, I think you covered it very well, Judge. Thank you. Um, so another question we have is, do you have any facts or data on the success of the rewards system that you mentioned where you're talking about graduation ceremony or that kind of four rewards per one punishment, which actually sounds great. Um, uh, you know, graduation ceremonies, uh, recognition, awards, et cetera, how do we know it's successful and how, su how successful is it? And I might even want to broaden it a little bit and kind of say like, you know, how much does the court look at sort of like, you know, social scientific analysis of the effectiveness of the various, you know, the various kinds of things that, that it does? So, um, Ann Harrod, Ann Harrod, do you want to talk about the data part of it that they may have? I can, and I can talk a little bit about the juvenile court side right. of it, but. Um, we don't have, I'm sure we don't have the statistics with us today. Not with us today, no. Yeah, on the success rate, but we do like have a court data analysis and we um, also reach out to our Department of Human Services in the county to help us review data. So it's something that um, we're continually looking at and, and going through, and especially with the um, MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge, um, we really started to examine the data and you know try to really make data informed um, decisions. So we'll look at recidivism rate um, and things of that nature when people go through these treatment courts. And I, I think anecdotally, I think it's very good. 
I don't think we have a high recidivism rate when somebody successfully completes our drug court program or our veterans court program was one of the, I think, most successful programs that we've had. Um, and it's, you know, I've gone to all these different graduations and the, the veterans court graduation is one of my favorite court events because you see these veterans who, you know, did so much for our country and then they, you know, they get in trouble. They, they have a DUI, they get a drug problem and, and whatnot. And, and to hear them speak about how this court um, has affected their lives and made it so much better. It's really, it's a, it's a very touching, touching moment. Right. And I, I would say on the juvenile side, so we have, um, there's actually really good data. We have good data locally, but there's also a lot of really good statewide data in Pennsylvania um, that runs through the Juvenile Court Judges Commission and the um, Center for Juvenile Justice Training and Research at Shippensburg University. So one of the things that the Juvenile Court Judges Commission does is they publish recidivism data. Uh, it took a while to determine how to do that. I mean, everybody had to agree upon how do you count recidivism? I mean, do you, is it two years out? Is it five years out? So they decided two years post case closure in the juvenile system, they would look at another adjudication of delinquency or a conviction uh, as an adult. And so they published that annually, um, you know, it's that sort of in that two year cycle, all of that data, all of those reports can be found on the Juvenile Court Judges Commission website. So if you go to uh, J jcjc.gov or just put Ju Pennsylvania Juvenile Court Judges Commission and you pull up their website, you can get those reports and see the data. So there is pretty good data that would indicate that as Ann Harris said, we don't have that data with us uh, today, but, um, but it, there is data to, sh to show that it is very effective. And we know from changes we've made, you know, when I first started, um, it was more often than not that kids who were arrested by the police were detained. When I started, Schumann Detention Center was filled all the time. Um, in fact, it was over capacity. Kids were sleeping on cots. And now, as you can see, like the average daily census is like 30 some kids. Sometimes it even drops lower than that. And a lot of the detention center is a lot of just unused space there. We also really use things that we thought were really great, like these boot camps and things for kids, which then the science and research show that they are actually harmful. They, they don't, you know, they don't really uh, make uh, uh, change. And in many cases, they're harmful. So we have no more boot camps. We stopped using them. And there's been a lot of emphasis in the juvenile justice system on adolescent brain development, how juveniles process information, because even juveniles have, who have act are charged with and have committed a very serious offense. Many of them are still at a low risk to recidivate because of a lot of reasons. I just say sort of in plain language, all the stars and planets were misaligned with that juvenile that day. He was with the wrong group. He, I mean, just everything that could have gone wrong in that juvenile's life went wrong and it ended in some kind of really horrific event. Doesn't mean that the juvenile doesn't need to be held accountable, but it's just for how long, what do you, in which way, and when do you close a case? And when are you confident that they have been rehabilitated and have really reduced the risk of recidivism. And interestingly enough, in the juvenile justice system, the juveniles that have the lowest rate of recidivism of all other juveniles are juveniles who have been adjudicated of sex offense, sex offenses and have completed sex offender treatment. They only have about a 3% recidivism rate. And even when they recidivate, it's almost never for another sex offense. So um, because the treatment is very good and it's very intense, uh, and it looks at not just the offending, but many of the juvenile offenders have been victims and they really do a good job at sort of the holistic kind of treatment for juvenile sex offenders. So there is pretty good data um, and some of it is really easily publicly available. I, you know, I would encourage people to go on the JCJC website to look statewide at, at the juvenile um, data, they publish it, they do a, a report every year about just offending in the state and they do a county by county um, analysis. So you could look and see what the, the data in Allegheny County shows for last year. Um, so uh, it's, it's really easily available. 
Well, thank you. I, I think we have, and that's actually a lot, a lot of good information. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And this one I think is really important, which is, um, it keeps on coming up when 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 people are uh, now we have so many people running for different offices and we can't talk about any of this specifically, but um, but they're going to be placed in different divisions of the court. And so this question is: uh, Is it true that that you you are the one who gets to decide which court division they're assigned to, and and whether it's you or you or, or or some other system? What is that process like? And and you know, do judges get to indicate preference, or how how is it that because a lot of judges are kind of out there saying, oh, I would like to be in this court. And if I was, you know, if I was elected, I'd be good at this court. But we actually don't know if they're going to be in that court. So technically speaking, the assignment of judges is up to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Um, but they do um, sort of, I guess, in a way, delegate that authority to the president judges. But um, when I, so I will make some decisions. I won't make them by myself. Um, we have four administrative judges and I will meet with them and we'll talk about um, what their needs are. I mean, we have a number of vacancies right now. So we need bodies in those seats uh, to do the work. And we'll look at a number of things. Yes, I would certainly consider preferences what type of law the judge practiced prior to um, uh, coming to the bench, whether there would be any conflicts of interest that are inherent for a judge going to a division. So, um, you know, for example, if you were married to the district attorney, I don't think you should practice, you should be a judge in the criminal division. So that would be a, a conflict of interest that I would feel you sh that, that judge could not be assigned to the criminal division because the bulk of the cases, there may be a few cases that are filed by the attorney general, but almost all of them are filed by the district attorney. So there would that would be an obvious conflict. Judges that are already sitting, some judges might have a desire to move to another division. So we would look at that. So there's a number of factors that are considered that we would consider um, in the assignment of the judges. And so once we kind of figure it out, then I would issue an order. Um, temporarily assigning a judge to a division. And then I have to file a petition with the Supreme Court asking them to permanently assign that judge to the division. So it's, so I kind of get to decide, but all, but really it's up to the Supreme Court. I have not had them, any assignments that I've made so far have, have the, I've not had them say no. So um, I, but, they're technically by rules of judicial administration, they make the assignments. Excellent, and you don't know like which courts yet, you don't know which which courts are gonna have the most vacancies or anything. Well, or I know that because I yeah. know who's, what's missing right now, I know that. And then, um, so, and I know who's coming off. So I, so I, I know where the nine, openings vacancies are I know where those judges were so I do know that I don't know who's going to win the election that's what I don't know so um, I have to wait and see about that first so okay excellent well I, I really want to thank uh, both of you so much for joining us this really uh, I, I feel like I know many things I didn't know an hour and a half ago. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who is, uh, who's joining us. And I do have, um, you know, we do have that. Is it okay with you if we make that PowerPoint available? Sure. We mm -hmm. want to see it. Okay. Cause we do have that PowerPoint and we'll find a way to, to make that available. I, I haven't, I don't know exactly how yet, but I feel like in the end, it's going to be Tessa who's going to figure out how to do it. <laughs> but um, somehow we're going to figure out how to, how to give people access to that really valuable tool. So thank you guys very much. And thank, thank you. Us. And everyone stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.